All right, everybody, welcome back. Um, <laughs> there's not many of us here yet, but if you're joining us online for the hymn sing part of tonight, uh, we're going to go ahead and get that started. Um, and I'm going to start with uh, one of, so you can grab a hymnal and start requesting here in a second if you want to. Uh, let's start with 444, though. This is a Holy Week hymn. It's one of my favorite hymns that I had never heard until. I came here and somebody introduced me to it. So, um, Trella, can we do, uh, uh, let's do one in four of 444. Since we're in Lent right now, if you pick one that has an Alleluia in it, we're all going to not sing the Alleluia, and then we're going to look right at you when the, the Alleluia comes up in the song. So be warned, everybody. Uh, if you have another song that you'd like to sing, yeah, go ahead, Shirley. 440. 440, okay. Oh, yeah, great. Do um, you have any verses that you'd like, Shirley? One and four, sounds good. 440 versus one and four.
ahead, Sandy. 436. 436. Alleluia, sing to Jesus. Good. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Go to Dark Gets of the 436 uh, verses. One and four. One and four. Okay. Four thirty. Hymn number 436, verses one and four. Four twenty-seven. All right. Do you have verses? Uh, <laughs> One and four. One and four. All right. A popular choice tonight. Seven, one and two. All right. And then Colleen will go to you next. So keep yours right up there. 437 verses one and two.
Colleen, what'd you have there? 770. 770. All right. Seven seventy. Oh, excellent. One and two on seven seventy. Excellent. explain the rules for the hymn sing. Of course, you're going rules to a hymn sing, but here, here's, here's what happens. We're in Lent now, so as you know, we put the Alleluia away for Lent. So you can pick any hymn that you want, but if you pick one that has an Alleluia, nobody's going to sing the Alleluia, and we're all going to stare at you when it comes up in the song. So just so you know what you're getting into if you pick a hymn. Anybody got another one? Go ahead, Pat. 801. 801. One and three. Oh, great, yeah. One and three for 801.
right at the end, we have time maybe for one last one, if somebody can pick one. Yeah, go ahead, Holly. Onward, Christian soldiers. Okay, do you know the number? No. Okay. <laughs> it starts with an O. It's seven something, I'm pretty sure. Yep, like I said, six something. <laughs> six sixty-two. Uh, do you have a couple verses, Holly? Uh, how about one and four? One and four sounds good. Six sixty-two, verses one and four. <laughs> especially what's to come, not only on Good Friday, but on, uh, on Easter itself. Uh, we'll be beginning our service today with uh, hymn 16, 16 and I, I missed it, but I'm Pastor, I'm Victor Jared, and this is Pastor Kale, not the other way around. I'm Victor, Pastor. Glad you're all here.
as you're able, please rise. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Praise to you, O Christ, Lamb of our salvation. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and repents of evil. Jesus said, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Christ was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. First reading for this evening comes from Exodus 40. Then the cloud that covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Our epistle reading for tonight comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul writes, We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, In a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise. We are treated as impostors, yet we are true, as unknown, yet well-known, as dying, and behold, we live, as punished, yet not killed, as sorrowful, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. As you're able, please rise for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel reading tonight comes from Matthew chapter 6. Jesus said, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they, they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will, will reward you. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting might be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. We continue then with the common responsory. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the, he in the heavens. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. We have an advocate with the Father. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered for the sins of the people. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is put away. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered for the sins of the people. We have an advocate with the Father. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. He was delivered us to death. He was delivered for the sins of the people. We confess, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. Third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life be seated for our sermon hymn.
here ever heard a song or a poem that just got stuck in your head? Maybe it was even a little bit annoying. Somebody could simply hymn a melody and it was back in there and it'd be there for days or maybe a week. You couldn't get it out. Today, though, I want to maybe get your minds thinking about songs or poems that got stuck in your head, not for the melody or the rhyme or the rhythm, but the message. What it was that the song or the poem had to say. One that comes to my mind is a song slash poem. It goes by the title of A Kind Invitation. In it, the artist recounts for us the tale of a youth. At the beginning, this youth, he's running on by the river, and he sees a woman that he soon recognizes to be love. He wants to meet with love, he wants to speak with her and see everything that she could show him, but soon he also realizes that there's a maybe dark figure standing nearby. He recognizes this figure to be death. The artist takes us on three distinct time periods in this young boy's life, youth, adulthood, and old age. In each, he busies himself with work or with play. He always ends up finding love somewhere, but every time he wants to run to her, he soon realizes that death is not too far behind. At the end of, the, at the end of this piece, the, the old man finds himself in a field as the sun begins to set, and death sits down next to him with love nowhere to be found. His life throughout the entire song was guided by fear, and he was led by fear of the unknown, fear of death. Regardless of if it's love, a pursuit of love, or if it's fear of death, or fear of the unknown, we are all led and guided by something. It might be a hobby or a passion for all of you, or it might be the pressure of life telling you to keep your nose down and work just a little bit harder. Whatever it is, whether you recognize it or not, these pursuits, these callings, your fears and your aspirations, those are what led you to be who you are. Right now, with your seats here, those aspirations and fears, that's what made you, you. But unfortunately, the voice that wins out more often than not is the voice of the world. Or maybe more importantly, it's the voice inside. It's the voice that calls us to sin. It's the one that calls us to the pleasure of the world, and it's the voice that calls us further from God. We're all reminded of this in our recognition and participation in Ash Wednesday, of course. Because of our sinfulness, the sinfulness of this world and all this brokenness, we all know the ultimate consequence of sin is death. Ash you are to ash you shall return. Because of our sinfulness and brokenness here, we know what comes. But the good news is that regardless of any of our mistakes, regardless of the beck and call of sin, we have a God that doesn't stop calling us either. His voice in his presence, it's always there. It might change, but it is always there for us, calling us to him. And today, I want to look at two ways that God calls to us, the way he remains with his people. First, we'll look at God as kind of a presence over the tabernacle from our Old Testament reading, and also, of course, in his presence, Christ walking around on his creation. So how does God present himself to his people? Well, first off, in our text from the book of Exodus, God's, God has lifted up his people from slavery, from Egypt, and now he's led them out to freedom. But, as we all know, God's people are sinful. They make mistakes, but God remains. At our point in this reading, God descends like a cloud on the tabernacle. And it's supposed to be a witness. It's supposed to tell God's people, Israel, that he is indeed with them. His glory does indeed shine, but it's shrouded by a cloud. So much so that not even Moses can enter the tent to see God's glory. God's people are sinful. They're broken, and that kind of brokenness can't face the glory of God. So a cloud remains. And of course, the presence of God literally leads Israel. When the cloud raises, God's people follow, and when it sets, God's people settle. Now, alternately, in Christ, we get a much different picture. We get a more personal, 
kind of God. In Christ, we don't get this arm's length kind of presence. We don't get a shrouded sort of presence. No, instead we get a personal God. Regardless of any sins that God's people commit, in Christ, he communes with them. He teaches them. He wants to be with them personally. And even more than that, through the selfless acts of Christ, God's people get to see his glory and his love and everything that he is. Take a second and think. Do any of you text and call your loved one, somebody close to you? I'm going to take a second here. Raise your hand if you think that you find yourself texting your loved ones more than you find yourself calling them. We got more texters in the house? I think some people are a little shy to wave, wave that five fingers, but that's okay. I fall in that category as well. We're called to text, or we, we find ourselves being drawn to text because it's easier. A study done by Psychology Today shows that texting is far less personal and effective than calling. Now, this might seem like a very simple statistic, and you're probably thinking, well, I already knew that. But the information given in this article is kind of startling. See, it said that five time, or people, spend fire, uh, people spend twice as much time texting than calling. And the amount of time people spend texting or on their smartphones waiting to receive a text, on average, is five hours a day. On average, people spend five hours a day trying to text or receive texts when they could just call. The hypothesis of this article was, of course, though, that when we text, we lose on the opportunity to have meaningful connections with one another. We lose out on the opportunity to hear voice inflections, to see facial expressions, and to share maybe some deep thoughts or concerns that you wouldn't share with everybody else. We miss out on having a connection with one another, and the truth is, is that we were made to be communal creatures. Even if you're an introvert, the fact of the matter is that you need face-to-face -face contact, and in Christ, that's what we get. We get face-to-face -face contact. We get the Zoom call, if you will, instead of just the text messages. The next question we have to ask ourselves is, what do these presences of God do for his people? Well, again, in our text for today from Exodus, we see God leading Israel. They haven't reached their promised land. They've been brought out of slavery, but they're still facing challenges and uncertainty and their very own sinfulness. God chooses to lead his people for, through this physical cloud so that they might see something and be led. The cloud is also God's love for his people. When God's people face uncertainty and challenges, the first thing they do is turn to themselves. They wonder, is God even here? Well, I bet if you could see this magnificent pillar of cloud moving and settling over the tabernacle, that question might start to fade away. God remains with his people so that they know he is with them. But again, in Christ, we get something a little bit different. If we fast forward, we see that in Christ, we don't simply get leading from point A to point B. We get leading down the path of righteousness. We get led down something important. But not only does Christ lead his people, he saves his people. Regardless of what the voices are that call you to sin, whatever it is that calls you away from God, Christ is there to claim you. Wherever you are in life, Christ is there to be with you. The task of the tabernacle for God's people was to lead them. But in Christ, it's not only being led. It's sharing the victory already won with his people. Christ does this because... He has claimed us, and he loves us. See, God has tasked him with leading down a path of righteousness, a path that Christ knows leads directly to the cross on your behalf and mine, and he does it anyway. He walks it anyway because he wants us, because he knows that that cross means claiming you and I as his dear children. It's a great thing to be led it's a great thing to be led in the right direction, know where you're headed, but it's an even better thing to be given the victory. 
With Winter Olympics still fresh in our minds, I don't know how many of you watched it, but I found myself watching some games. I want you to think back to the many different events that you might have watched. So many incredible athletes came across your screen participating in the competition that they might win, that they might find glory, and of course we were all entertained by it, riveted. But do you ever stop and think about the amount of training that goes in in order for them to be able to have this five minutes of glory, maybe? For instance, I'm a big fan of the ski jump. I mean, they're going so fast, then you add in that extreme amount of height from that jump, and it's, it's intense, it's scary. Their coaches must spend an immense amount of time teaching them the proper technique so that they can be this human javelin, so to speak, and know how to land safely. But if you ask any coach or any ski jumper, I'm sure all of them will tell you nobody has ever done the perfect ski jump. No matter how hard you try, no matter how much practice you put in, the perfect jump just isn't possible. See, the same is true for us. But unfortunately, when we follow Christ, it's not that we miss it by a little bit. It's that as time goes on, our gap between our training and where we fall becomes wider and wider and wider. We need Christ. Try as we may to follow God, we never hit the mark. But Christ wins the gold for us anyway. And that brings me to the last question. What's the implication for God's people from these two forms? Ultimately, the tabernacle offers hope to Israel. God leads his people. He gives them a promise that he will remain, a physical promise through the cloud, and he points them to salvation, something to come. The thing that he points them to, of course, though, is Christ. Christ doesn't point us to something down the line, something else that needs to come to win the victory because he has already won the victory. Christ came and he freed all believers and he promised eternal life to you and to me. Christ is the example and the guide. He leads us on the path of righteousness, but he has also claimed you and given you the victory of righteousness. The time has finally come that I will share the ending to that song slash poem from the beginning that stuck with me. When the young man found himself in this field looking at sunset, he started to speak with death. And he learned from death himself that no matter where love was, death was always going to be near behind. See, the man was guided his entire life by fear and something he didn't even know, something that he couldn't possibly comprehend. But as Christians, that's not the fact. As Christians, we know the end. We know that death is defeated. In fact, in just a short amount of time, we're going to receive the imposition of ashes, remembering that one day, yes, our bodies will return to dust, but death is not what's waiting there for us. It's Christ waiting with an open hand to call us to life eternal. You and I have been given blessed callings from Christ himself to be his children, to be with him in eternity. When tribulation comes, Christ is there to carry you through. And when it is, in fact, our time to sit and watch the sun set, know that it's not death there waiting for you, but instead Christ with open arms to welcome you home. Amen. As we continue our service, we join in the prayer of the church. As you're able, please rise. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the gift of divine peace and pardon, with all our heart and with all of our mind, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. 
for the Holy Christian Church here and scattered throughout the world, and for the proclamation of the gospel and the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this nation, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For seasonable weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous, and for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. For all those in need, for the hungry and homeless, the widowed and the orphaned, and for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick, the dying, and all those who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Finally, for these and all of our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, Christ have mercy. Lord, have mercy. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins, for I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, in our Lord Jesus Christ, on this day in the church, we begin this holy season of prayerful and penitential reflection of Lent. Our attention today is especially directed to the holy sufferings and death of our Lord Jesus Christ. From ancient times, this season has been kept as a special time of devotion and self-denial, and a humble repentance born of a faithful heart that dwells confidently on God's word and draws from it life and hope. So let us pray that our dear Heavenly Father, for the sake of his beloved Son and in the power of the Holy Spirit, might bless us this Lenten tide so that we may come to Easter with glad hearts and keep the feast with sincerity and truth. Let us pray. O oh God, you desire not the death of sinners, but rather that they turn from their wickedness and live. We implore you to have compassion on the frailty of our mortal nature, for we acknowledge that we are dust, and to dust we shall return. Mercifully pardon our sins that we may obtain the promises you have laid up for those who are repentant. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> As a reminder of our humility before God, we enter into this season of penitence with the symbol of the cross imposed upon our foreheads and on our hands. This ash and these words that are spoken to us are reminders of the dust from which we are created. They are reminders, reminders of the dust to which our bodies will one day return, and they are reminders of our sin and our humble posture of repentance before God, who loved us enough to send Jesus to die for all of us. Please be seated. We continue now with the imposition of ashes, and you kind of have three options when you come up. Uh, you can receive, it on, uh, receive the ashes on your forehead, you can receive the ashes on your right hand, or you can just receive the ashes on your heart. Uh, if you don't want to have ashes put on your forehead or your hand, just give us one of these when you come up, and uh, we'll make the sign of the cross and say, from dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Um, as, you're, uh, as, as we're entering this, this time of the imposition of ashes, uh, we won't go row by row or anything like that. I'll station myself right here so you guys over there can come up as you want. Um, I would suggest everybody comes up through the middle and uh, um, as you, uh, as, before you come up, pray a little bit. As you go back, pray a little bit and we'll enter into this imposition of ashes together.
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The Almighty and most merciful Lord, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you always. Amen. Please be seated for our closing hymn.